Oh yeah, the hood is back, baby. Okay, let's do this, right? Right. So, now, top 10 games. We've done a little bit of everything. Now let's talk about games that aren't easy to get. I mean, there's plenty of hotness going around, right? But what are the games that are hard to get? The games that have gone out of print status. I'm not talking about out of stock, let me be very clear. There's plenty of games that go in and out of stock all the time, the price shoots up and whatever. You know, eventually another run comes around and the price goes back down to, and you know, you can get it, whatever. This is games that are no longer available from a printing retail side of things. So if you are getting them, you are getting them on the secondary market because there is no other retail market, period. This was a harder list to make than some of most. There are a lot of really, really good games that are really hard to get nowadays. Now, again, being patient helps, but sometimes you just can't get them. Let's talk. Now, the first one up on this list, let me be very clear, this is an honorable mention because I know people clamor after it, but compared to some of the other games that are thought of as essentially like classics on this list, I couldn't not mention it though at the same time, is Camp Grizzly. If you're not familiar with this, this is your 70s rote slasher film in a board game side of things. Scream in a board game, if you will, if I need to reference things. And you're going around, Otis, I believe, is the homicidal killer, the NPC that you're facing off against the game. You're going around trying to find weapons, upgrades, ways to better take him out. But as the body count rises, as it says, he becomes stronger, so you got to be aware. There's events in the camp, and, you know, it's just a thematic smash em up type game with a horror theme. It's on a print. People are desperate. People are paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I think someone just literally linked me a copy that was sold for like $1,500 on eBay recently. People are desperate to get this very niche game. And um, that's cool. Now, again, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just not saying compared to the other ones on this list. And you'll know why if you look at the list already. If you're spoiling yourself down below in the comment section, you'll see why it didn't make the list. But at least from that side of things, I wanted to give it an honorable mention as it's really done something that nothing else has been able to capture well. There have been a couple other games that have tried. Nothing that has appealed to people as much as this one. So that's Camp grizzly if you will in a nutshell and that's like a couple grand's worth of game right there on the back shelf right there that's whoo whoo real cash okay let's get to the list okay so now disclaimer these are in no particular order i'm just going to go through them you can rank them yourself if you want in the comment section number 10 this is lord of the rings confrontation now you'll notice a theme interestingly enough i made up this list without actually looking at who these were designed by Full disclaimer, though, Nizia, this ain't his only one on the list, you know? <laughs> so if you're not familiar with Lord of the Rings Confrontation, this is the deluxe version, if you will. The regular version also came out several years beforehand in 2002. The deluxe came out in 2005. If you're not familiar with this game, essentially what this is, is as I've heard it described, and as it's self-described in many ways, Stratego with Lord of the Rings, where, you know, if you're familiar with the old school, uh, very mainstream Stratego, where you've got these little standee guys, and they've got numbers, and they're not facing the opponent, so they can't see what number they are, and you move and you attack, and it's a game of sort of chicken and seeing and remembering where their numbers are as you're moving them across the board. Well, imagine that with Lord of the Rings, make it thematic and make all nine of those characters asymmetric and different powers and abilities. Oh, now you've actually got a well depth and thought out game. Now, the deluxe version differs than the regular version because the deluxe version, it makes them more plastic standees. It also adds 18 more characters that you can play in this game. And the interesting thing is when you read the reviews, which I have done because I actually just got a copy of this Grail game uh, online a few weeks ago of the regular version, not the deluxe version. Deluxe version will cost you probably about twice as much right now, 50 to $100, depending on which version you want. But people are split. The elegance and the, the nature of this one without having just too much going on is very appealing. Uh, there's some thought that some of these additional 18 characters kind of take it over the top, maybe unbalance it as much. And so there's a divide when you read the reviews about which one people prefer. 
But all in all, as a thematic Lord of the Ring games from a Stratego side of things, who'd have thought? But that's why it's on the list. Now, I didn't actually even plan this, but next up is another Nizia. This is thought to be one of Nizia's masterpieces, Tigris and the Euphrates. This is, you know, oddly enough, as self-described, culture, conflict, and civilization, where you're farming, trading, um, you know, a little bit of battling, but it's a tile-laying game. And the interesting thing on this is I'm going to sort of push on this one as well with two versions just like Lord of the Rings. And that's because the re-implementation of Tigris and Euphrates, Yellow and Yangtze, which I own a copy of. I've not actually played Tigris and Euphrates. I know, blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. But now that I know I like Yellow and Yangtze, I would love to be able to play Tigris and Euphrates because this has also gone out of print because of a falling out with Grail Games. And there was supposed to be an expansion for this as well. And I absolutely love this game. I've never played anything like it. I think it is, again, a masterpiece. And again, just like with Lord of the Rings Confrontation, there's a split on people who think this is better and this is better. Now, again, I like this one. I'm sure I would like the other one. The nuances, the differences, I'll leave those for the bloggers and the reviewers in the Board Game Geek forums. But both of these are very unique. Take that strategy, but also a lot of tactical nature tiling the amount of strategy going into placing these hexagonal tiles on this board cannot be under exaggerated i didn't realize it until the second or third play how much actually goes into this how much of a great game this is and how much of it sometimes comes down to what you can get versus what you can't get especially with these tiles that you're seeing in the lower right hand corner now again not everyone's gonna like this this is heavy take that you're doing some battling the battles themselves between areas uh, sometimes can be confusing and you got to remember which ones affect where and how and there's a few of those types of rules and so it's not the easiest thing to pick up but once you pick it up in that sense it's fan fantastic speaking from first-hand experience a game that's never going to leave my collection <laughs> probably before it was out of print but now that it's out of print and it's going for like 125 bucks each of these are ish uh you're going to be hard pressed to find them for a more reasonable price so that's why yellow and yangzi as well as tigris and euphrates are on this list I didn't even realize it. I'm just going to go straight to it, make it all easy. Make this the Nizia Trace. Now, this is one of the other in the Nizia Tile Lang trilogy, and this is Samurai, which came out even before Tigris and Euphrates, where you were trying to win the favor of one of the three factions, the peasants, the priests, and the samurai. Hence the name. I'm even less experienced in this one because, again, haven't been able to get a copy because it's out of print, which is why it's on the list in the first place. But quick striking, very tactical, very ability to change what you're doing during the middle of the game. And honestly, one of these versions is very beautiful to look at because there are several iterations. And this is the one that I would love to have a copy of. But again, it's hard to come by. These are not, you know, flying off the shelves everywhere. People are holding on to these games because, again, they're very, very, very well thought of. I mean, hence, again, the list. So if you're looking for something of that ilk, if you've never experienced one of these three games, you know, you really should. I would really endorse it. As someone who was terrified that this was going to be too hard or too deep, Yellowing Yangtze was perfect for me. And if you look at one of these three, I guarantee that you will have a good experience with them if you choose the right one for you. Check them out. And especially if you can find one at a good deal, might be worth picking it up. So there you go. The Nizia 3. Now, let's get on to the non-Nizias because uh, I feel like I'm just spouting his stuff. I feel like I'm just a promo man for him at this point. Next one on this list, Complete Departure. A little bit of my own bias in here. This is Czar from the GIPF series, G-I-P-F. The top rated abstract games on Board Game Geek. Like five of them are coming from this GIPF series, all from the same designer. That's insane, right? It's almost like the Nizia where he's got all of those other games that I mentioned in like the top 200. Insane. But think of Nizia... Only think of that now on the abstract side of things, and that's the equivalence of what you've got going on here. This is the seventh rated abstract game overall. And this isn't a recent game either. This is like, you know, within the last decade or so. 
And this is the 2016 version, the version I actually just bought on the secondary market for someone selling it. Now, obviously it's an abstract, obviously it's not going to appeal to anyone, but the seventh rated abstract game doesn't get there by accident. And until recently with some of like the Azuls knocking it out from the abstract side of things, it was even higher. You're taking these pieces, you're trying to decide whether or not you want to stack them up on top of each other so you can make them more powerful so then you can go capture other people's that are smaller. Or if you want to try and go after other people's quicker and, you know, not stack them up because the only way you win is if the other person can't get one of yours or if you run out of one of the three different types of pieces. It sounds a little bit complicated, but it also sounds a little bit easy at the same time. And it's just elegant. These games are so, so well designed. I am horrible at them, but I love them. At some point, if I can get my hands on two or three of the other GIP series, I would love to put out a video that we watched by a hundred of you ranking my personal preferences of the GIP series and why. I have only three right now, so I'm working on that still, but I'm going there. But it's not in print. It's not. I literally searched the whole internet I found one shop over in Europe that was selling it, and that was about it. There's a couple on the Board Game Geek Market all over in Europe, and otherwise it's just not available. And so if you want to get your hands on it again, you're going the secondary market side of things, not retail. So if you have interest in these wonderfully terrific games from Chris Berm, you need to check him out. He is the modern-day abstract equivalent of Nizia. I'll put that out there. No questions asked. I have... No doubts about it. I will fight you in the comment section about that. So there you go, czar. We're going to, again, stay with the theme of something completely different here. This is Fury of Dracula. Now, this specific edition is the third slash fourth edition, which, again, somehow it's a third slash fourth edition has gone out of print. I mean, that was the whole purpose of the third slash fourth edition in the first place, was the second edition had gone out of print. This is debatably, right now, regarded as the best hidden movement game that has been made. You are Dracula versus the hunters trying to kill Dracula. You are castlevania in the hidden movement mechanism genre. You're hunting this bad boy across the land through day and night phase where you're moving in both, he's only moving in one, and you need to find him before he can escape and kill him. So, are you up for the challenge? Now, the difference between the 3rd and the 4th edition is apparently the 4th edition comes with pre-painted miniatures, so you can utilize them on this wonderfully large, magnificent board uh, you'll be traversing. And you get a little bit of everything else in terms of your player characters and your powers that you can use. So it is, for a good reason, very highly regarded, like I said, this standard bearer for hidden movement style games right now. We'll see if anything else can absorb it, but right now it's standing the test of time and right now it's going to be harder and harder to get because, well, it's out of print. So check it out if you're interested. Now we're going to go with something completely different here with the next one, but the next two are going to be somewhat similar in that sense. First up is going to be Chaos in the Old World, a, a Warhammer themed game. An asymmetric faction, Cthulhu Wars before Cthulhu Wars, the Eric Lang as some would argue, piece de resistance of his work for even the last decade, even with all of his other games, as a supremely well-balanced area control game, folks on a map, battling with asymmetric evil monster powers that pays best with a meta, especially at higher counts, even four, five, and six. Now, the interesting side tangent here is when I was first getting into this hobby, I ended up, um, you know, just having this copy that I got of a game that I ended up trading. I won't tell you the game of the original game because that would kind of blow the story a little bit, but I ended up trading for it for a copy of Marvel Legendary. And, you know, I played Marvel Legendary at the time, you know, it was just the base game and there were only a couple, like maybe three expansions out total. And so I, I was just turned off by it. And so I ended up trading it for, guess what? I ended up trading for a Legendary Marvel base game alone for a copy of Chaos in the Old World, here's the kicker, with the Horned Rat expansion. So I ended up getting, whoa, right? Right, that's a lopsided deal uh, that neither of us knew at the time was gonna be completely lopsided. It was about three, four months after that that they announced Chaos in the Old World was gonna go out of print. That was never gonna be made again. And guess what? 
my copy all of a sudden, boom, shot through the roof. I ended up selling it. Uh, because I, as you've heard me say multiple times on this channel, this is not my type of game. But when it comes to this style of games, again, talking about standard bearers for area control asymmetric factions, this is one that people still pine after, especially with the Horned Rat expansion, which has become harder and harder to find when equaling the cost for even just from an expansion standpoint of the base game alone at this point. It's become a grail game for a lot of people, especially the expansion. So it's never going to be remade. Going to find a copy if you want it, but it's going to cost you. That's why it's on the list. Next up, though, we're staying in the Warhammer universe, and we're going over to Forbidden Stars. More of the re-implementation, remake, re-theme, rethink of more of the StarCraft. If you are familiar with StarCraft as a video game, this was, as they say, barring, you know, StarCraft the board game, the most faithful, best playing interpretation of that, although it was a bit heavy as well. I mean, another battling area majority control style of game with lots of guys, as you can see here, on the map in the first place, where you're taking one of four military factions and going head to head, trying to achieve certain objectives within the sector or the galaxy that you're in. And again, heavy, beautiful, Game's going for 100 plus per copy right now because of licensing issues and splits from FFG. So again, interestingly enough, we're seeing it from a very thematic side of things with these area control games that are just not really, you know, finding a permanent home. As they say in the description, short-term bluffing with long-term strategy that pays off in a civilization military escalating, building, strengthening style of things. And if that is of your ilk, not of the 4X, but of the planning strategy, and take that, this is your spacefaring game to be looking at, especially if you're a fan of the Warhammer universe or StarCraft in general in the first place. And that's why it's on the list. Now, the next one up should be no surprise. It's probably the least surprising one on this list, but it has to be included because it's so well thought of. It's definitely not for everyone. It definitely doesn't appeal to everyone. There definitely was a concern about what would happen with copies of this when Unfathomable came out, but this is Battlestar Galactica. And truth be told, as Unfathomable is slowly reaching the market now, I don't think, as I predicted previously when Unfathomable was announced, that this is going to terribly be affected because I've already heard people say that have played Unfathomable that they, yes, they prefer one or the other, but Unfathomable is not a pure remake. It is doing things different. They don't feel it's as thematically incorporated. It's simplifying it a little bit, not always in the best way. And so you've got a lot of people still clamoring for this, especially with the strong tie to the amazing TV series in the first place. This is the penultimate hidden traitor game where you are playing as humans trying to get to the promised land only to realize that there's Cylons fracking in your midst and you need to try and figure out who they are before getting taken down by a forking Cylon. Can you do it? Can they reveal themselves and sabotage things and prevent you from doing what you need to do? I mean, that's the whole dilemma of this game. The expansions are even more hard to come by than the base game themselves, all three of them, Exodus, Pegasus, and Daybreak. All of them will go for easy triple digits, if not almost $150 to $200 for a complete expansion that is still in the box. It's going to cost you a pretty penny. There is nothing out there like it, even with Unfathomable being the closest thing, and we will probably never see anything that is quite comparable in all aspects going forward unless something very very similar or a true reprint is done which again is completely probably unlikely it is as people say an experience to be had but again it is not a short game it is a deep game it is a meta involving game where people need to know their roles and do their roles so that everyone can compete at the same level that's the biggest barrier. That's also why people would sell it because, you know, the idea of that versus the actuality of that is often the problem with these types of games. But all of those reasons make it on this list. 
Next up, and this is probably going to be the most controversial one on this list if I'm really picking the best games, but this is Shadows Over Camelot from Days of Wonder. In other words, rumors about like sort of a steampunk dark-ish reprint uh, that have sort of gone nowhere in the last two years. But from this Bruno Cathala Days of Wonder hit, this is again thought of as one of the most simplistic but yet it works from a thematic experience hidden traitor type games along the lines of Battlestar Galactica. Now again, it's nothing as complex, it's nothing as deep, it's nothing as meta. I mean, this is a game where the mechanisms are straightforward and it's more bluffing and meta-ing and accusations more like resistance or coup than it is Battlestar Galactica, very nuanced strategic playing. But you know what? Sometimes there is a very good role for this type of game, especially with a six to eight player count where there's more than one trader. And again, it's a heck of a lot of fun. And so it's out of print. The expansion, Merlin's expansion is even more out of print. And it's just a lot of fun. I don't really know what else to say beyond that. Again, it's not going to give you the deepest game experience. It's not going to be the most strategic. Even the tactical nature is, you know, sometimes yelling at each other and throwing around random accusations. But sometimes that is a heck of a lot of fun. And that's why we got into this hobby in the first place was fun. And this is what that game emulates more so than anything else. And that's why I wanted to include it on this list. So argue with me if you will, but I think it's among there. So there you go. Shadows over Camelot. The only Feld game to make this list, and you can argue that this is sort of out of print, but not really because of the remake coming from Queen Games, but I'm going to argue that the Z-Man game, again, is set apart enough and people love it enough that it's still highly sought after and highly in demand, especially with the expansions. Dice management, hand management, different cards with different abilities, choosing which actions you want to play to combo how, this is a classic Feld six ways to try and get the points that you need sort of game. It is probably one of the more well-known ones. It's probably more of one of the well-regarded ones all around. Now, I've, the Feldians out there that are really deep into the Feld games are going to argue that this is not the best one by any means. But this is also, I would say, the most mass appeal and the most appealing, at least, that I am generally aware of as someone who does not do this type of game regularly. And that sort of thing cannot be understated when you're talking about games of this heavier, not heavy, but heavier nature when you have other people who are at the other end of the spectrum not playing games like this usually at all in the first place. And so to appeal to more of that crowd is something that cannot be understated, which is why the Queen Games semi-reprint slash rebranding slash redo of this game in the form of Hamburg was so successful in the first place. So... It's got two expansions, one of which is very highly sought after uh, on the Zwin, I believe. And again, super hard to get, super well thought of as just a very well-rounded, very excellent game that is fun to play. And that is why it's on the list. Now, the last two on this list shouldn't be any surprise, but one of them may surprise you that it's this high. I would argue that these next two games are perhaps the two best games that are out of print and on this list. And that's saying a lot. And again, you can argue with me in the comment section. The first one here is El Grande. El Grande, the mother of all area control games. I would argue the best area control game out there. The best stand of time comparatively even to the ones that come out nowadays. It even has the shut up and sit down recommendation. I mean, that's a very broad appeal. It has my recommendation, which again, as someone who does not like these types of games, says something. I mean, this is the ultimate putting cubes on a map. There's no deluxification. There's no messiness to it. It's here's some cards each round, bid on when you want to go to choose them and when you want to take your turn with a same set of cards that everyone has, that everyone has the potential to lay down. Take your turn and see what happens. Now, again, there's a bunch of expansions. You can get them, but the core game in and of itself will last you session after session after session after session after session after session. After session. 
It's out of print. There's several versions. There's the Decentennial version. There's the big box version. But you know what? Just the regular standalone vanilla El Grande version is going to be more than enough for you because it is that good of game. Period. It is the sheer definition of elegance in simplicity without needing all of the fancy bells and whistles to make it scream, look at me. And that is why you should play it, and that is why it's on the list as a game I think all gamers in our hobby should at least experience or play. Now, the last one, the last one, again, this one might be controversial, but I'll make an argument that it shouldn't be. And that's Android Netrunner, the card game, the LCG, the out of print, but still in print LCG, if you know what I mean. Because fans have picked this up and made their own expansions to officially print them, that you can buy them from websites from, and you can continue on playing this long, long lasting LCG well after its official expiration date. This is thought to be the ultimate dueling LCG deck constructing game out there, period. It's not for everybody. The learning curve is especially high. The price to entry at this point is also high, but with the new fan-made expansions, it's gonna be easier because they're allowing entry now in from that side of things. On one side of things, you have a massive corporations trying to snuff out and control everything, going up against lone runners or hackers against the system. This is an asymmetric one-on-one -on -one battling game that has a competitive scene. It is super well thought of. People put this game almost above all else on the deck construction side of things that have ever been, period. It's ranked third, but a lot of people who have played it and played it deep rank it over the other ones. It's just it doesn't have as much broad mass appeal as some of the more mainstream IPs. I'm looking at you, Marvel and Arkham Horror, but that's okay. I've never played it. I would love to play it. I would love to pick up a collection. But it's the deck construction side of things that is the barrier to entry more so in this one, especially on the competitive side of things, and especially with the out-of-print status and all of the packs that go along with that that make it that much harder to get into. You can see here, just in the phases of what you're doing, this is not a simple, straightforward game. This is not a game that you pick up and just start playing after a few minutes. You can arguably do that with something like Marvel Champions or maybe even Lord of the Rings, but this is not that, and that's the appeal, but also the barrier in the first place. Someday, someday, maybe I'll be able to play it, but until then, it's out of print-ish, but maybe we'll see more of a resurgence with the fan-made creation backing. All in all, though, that's why it's on the list. So there you go. That is my top 10 out of print games that you should be aware of that you should maybe try and play at some point. Maybe not own. That's a pretty expensive list if you try and go and buy all those right now, especially the honorable mentioned one, which might cost you more than most of the other ones on the list combined. But um, there you go. Obviously, again, there were games that I did not choose on this list that were hard cuts, but there you go. Let me know which ones you think definitely belong in this list. Let me know ones that you think should have been on this list. Talk to me in the comment section. There you go. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks for putting up with me. If you liked it, give me a subscription if you're going to want to watch more. Because that's what I'm putting this out for in the first place. Stay classy. I'll see you around.